uh, many of you know that we received a $65 million donation from Charlie Munger about a year ago, uh, who's the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, and since then, I, my life's um, been part-time manager of a large construction project. Uh, so this is a 75,000 square foot facility to house the visitors to the KIGP. Now, it's not a new office building, but rather it's a, a place to be. So it's a big physics house. Um, and it's a lot of fun designing something, uh, telling the contractors and everybody that, look, it's going to be full of physicists. <laughs> everybody in this building will have a PhD, so don't give me complicated HVAC that doesn't work. <laughs> everybody understands that joke because everybody's had that experience. <clears throat> um, so this was the state of the basement a while back. Uh, this is the state as of about a week ago. Uh, the steel's going up. Um, and. Uh, uh, I've never seen so much concrete and so much steel, but seismic standards are outrageous, and this building will last for a long time. Where is it right now? It's, it's one mile west of the KITP. One mile west. So it's adjacent to Isla Vista, just north of Isla Vista. Um, okay, so enough of that, though that's a large part of my life right now. What I want to talk about um, is the new insights we're getting into stellar interiors from astroseismology. And um, in particular, um, you know, we do know a lot about stars, as all of you know, but there's some things that we've not really been able to probe until in the last few years. And that's what I want to talk about, which is deep interior states, what's going on with rotation deep within stars, and at the end I'm going to close with what's going on in magnetism deep within stars um, from recent work that we've just, that's going to appear in science, hopefully in about two weeks, and then a follow-up paper with the observers in nature. So. There's a lot of collaborators I'm working with on this. The two in red are the, are the two I'm most actively work, working with right now. Matteo Canciola, who's a postdoc at KITP, and Jim Fuller, uh, who shares his time between Caltech and KITP. Um, and the others are uh, other individuals that'll pop up as I go through. Uh, Dennis Stello uh, is the prime observer that we've been working with on all of the observational interpretation data I'm going to be showing you from the Kepler satellite. So let me launch in and start by just giving you a context. I, everything I'm going to talk about today are for stars roughly between one and two solar masses, which you all would say should be the most boring possible stars to study. Uh, however, as I'm going to show you, we now can probe uh, the interior states of these stars at different phases of evolution. So before I do that, I want to remind you um, of what these stars do, because not everybody in the room uh, lives and breathes stars. I'm presuming. Um, so this is the HR diagram in theoretical units, T effective log luminosity, showing evolutionary tracks from 0.8 up to 7 solar masses. And on the right is it showing you what's happening in the center of the star. So this is central density in grams per cubic centimeter, central temperature in Kelvin, showing again the, the trajectory of the core of these stars uh, from this mass range. And the major thing I'm going to talk about are from one to two solar mass stars. All of them, uh, as they exhaust the hydrogen in their core and build helium, uh, basically helium white dwarfs at their core, then progress up what we call the red giant branch all the way to this high luminosity around 10 to the 3 in a bit, at which point the core is about a 0.48 solar mass ball of helium that ignites in an off-center flash. Uh, that off-center flash uh, leads to the star rapidly collapsing down, coming back down the Hayashi track, basically, and sitting at a luminosity that's determined um, by both hydrogen and helium burning in the core as it sits in what we call the clump. That's pretty much what all one to two solar mass stars do. In the central temperature plane, central density, they cross the degeneracy curve to the right of this line. The electrons become degenerate. Um, this is showing how all of these stars basically converge to the same track in the core temperature density plane. This is the ignition of the helium core flash, uh, which leads to an um, uh, adiabatic decompression, first in the core in a cooling. And then as a thermal wave gets to the core, it comes up and it sits here on the helium main sequence. Can you remind us what the mass is that you used? Is that uh, this, this time scale uh, is about 2 million years for the transition. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned yes. It's an off-center flash. The core is cooled by neutrinos, um, and so the peak in temperature is not at the center of the star. 
So there's a succession of off-center shell flashes that convert the helium ball to a, a um, ideal gas. Sphere, s sorry, 1D. Every, all stars are 1D for now. <laughs> I'm not going to discuss a horizontal branch. Who asked? Yeah, no, I'm not going to discuss a horizontal branch. If you can explain the origin of the horizontal branch in, under physical diagnostics, I'd love to hear it. Okay. So um, the, the main thing that's happened are the launch of these two satellites. Uh, Kuro is on the left. Uh, this was, again, a space-based satellite that was doing astroseismology, 27 centimeter diameter. But most of the data I'm going to show you today is from the Kepler satellite, um, which, as all of you know, is now in a different mode of observing, which will be even more exciting for astroseismology uh, because they're looking in different parts of the galaxy. So from space, you can do things that you can't do from the ground, in this case, highly accurate photometry. Um, and so uh, Kepler typical uh, it was about a 30 minute cadence. There were about 10 to the 4 red giants that had been selected by the Kepler Astroseismic Consortium, of which I'm not a member, uh, over a four year period. So the data I'm going to show you is from that. Uh, the Corot data, uh, which looked in different parts of the galaxy, smaller numbers of stars, but basically uh, equally valuable data. Corot's done, and Kepler, of course, persists. Now, this plot. There's some pieces of galactic science I'm just going to mention, but I'm not going to talk about, but I want to highlight. Uh, what you're seeing here is the Kepler field uh, looking down on the plane, showing you where they looked. And these points are the red giants that were observed in the field. And the distances they've put them at are based on the astroseismic understanding of the giant. Okay, So they're getting distances to stars from astroseismology, and I'll explain that. Corot looked in different fields, so these were two different fields Corot looked at. And you can see they basically had comparable uh, depths. K2 is the new Kepler mission. For those of you who haven't tracked it, um, they've lost enough gyros that it's difficult to point. So they now use the radiation pressure on a, a symmetric orientation of the satellite to give it stabilization. They weather vein it using the sun. Uh, which means they have to change their pointing roughly every three months. And so uh, that's now allowing for uh, tremendous amounts of data uh, for different parts of the, of the galaxy. And these just show the planned pointings. And we're in 2015 now. And I'm not going to know where we're about to point. The astronomers in this community do it. It looks backwards, so it tends to look in regions you can't see from here. But basically, um, as you can tell, we're, you know, it's in the ecliptic plane. It has to be. But most importantly, it's crossing the galactic disk in many locations, many open clusters, um, many more massive stars will be studied, um, and unusual systems will be studied. So it's get ready. You know, what I'm going to tell you today is just the beginning of what's going to really start happening. Tess and Plato uh, will also really dramatically improve the situation. The, there's a whole amount of uh, work done with Tess on astroseismic preparation. Since all the data comes down, it's a less of a problem than it was with Kepler, where with Kepler you had to decide your targets in advance. Um, and then Plato is sort of all this on steroids. Or what happens if you spend, I don't know, a billion dollars? I don't know what's Plato. OK. So um, if you haven't had a course in astroseismology, that's what you're going to get. Um, and I think it's important because this field's really just starting. So I'm going to study two kinds of waves. So I have a star. You can think of it as a large gaseous object. One type of wave it can support, of course, are just acoustic waves, what you're hearing right now. Um, and that's the restoring force is due to the compression of the gas within the star. So that's an acoustic wave. But there's one other type of mode available to a star, which is that if I take a fluid element um, and move it up adiabatically, and if I'm in a stable part of the star, it's denser than the surroundings, and it falls back. That means there's a, an, another restoring force to a non-radial oscillation that has to do with the buoyancy in the star. And that natural frequency of oscillation of that perturbation is what we call the brunt weissele frequency. And you're going to see that everywhere. That's big N squared um, in this formula. And that gives you another set of modes, which uh, unfortunately we call gravity waves. 
Okay? So I'm just going to say it. These are not gravitational waves. <laughs> These are gravity waves. And I don't know what else to say to you other than you just have to live with that. Okay? Um, and so if I just do a small wavelength perturbation um, and just write a local dispersion relation, I can ask what's the radial wave number, and it depends on the frequency of the wave relative to the brunt weissler frequency, and the frequency of the wa wave relative to the lamb frequency. This is the lamb frequency. You can see this knows about the sound speed, the L, the L of the eigenfunction, and the local radius. And if I want to have an oscillation, I want the way I've written this uh, to be positive. This is assumed to be imaginary. So if I'm doing a wave, I want a mega squared bigger than these two quantities. So in the high frequency limit, I basically am doing acoustic waves. Omega is then roughly sound speed times the wave number. That you, I think, all probably know. Learned on your parents' knees. In which case, these are evenly spaced in frequency. All right, and you're going to see that from the data. I'm going to show you that. For G modes, I need to have the opposite to get an oscillatory. I have to be less than the brunt and less than the lamb frequency. And you're, I'm going to show you plots with these variables. Obviously, these variables know about where you are in the star. And in that case, the dispersion relation uh, looks like this. And in the high wave number limit, these are uniformly spaced in period. Okay, so gravity waves have a very different um, character. Um, and you're going to see this period spacing pop up, I, I'm telling you things here that you will need to know as I go through my slide set. Okay? So, this will be on the test <laughs> because these things are being observed. Okay? So this is no longer an abstract uh, game. I'm sorry? You're going to see it right now. The KR is just a local, this is my local wave number. I'm just doing, the top thing is just a local WKB. Yeah, there's a continuum. That's right. Okay, so here's these uh, the brunt frequency and the lamb frequency for the sun, which happens to be a nearby star. Um, and so, so this is the this is the coordinate within the sun out to the surface. This is the brunt weissler frequency shown here. This is the convective envelope in the sun, where of course the brunt goes to zero because the presumption is in an adiab in a convection zone, you're adiabatic, in which case. As I move the fluid element up, it has exactly the same density as the stuff around it. Therefore, it has no restoring force. Okay? And that's why this goes to zero. And then this is a lamb frequency, which remember is the sound speed squared divided by the radius. And so this rises as you go up. And this is for L equals 1, L equals 2, and L equals 3, which is also going to be really important as I start talking about waves. So this is the sun. For the sun, we've seen acoustic waves. We've not seen any internal gravity waves. So this line here is just showing w the typical, this is a five minute oscillation. Yeah. Somebody can check me. 2,000 microhertz, you gotta love their units. Um, I think that's five minutes, but I haven't checked it. Okay, so that's the sun. Everything I'm gonna talk about are gonna be red giants, have a very different structure, and you're gonna see that as I, as I go through the talk. Okay? So G modes propagate, so let me just say it out loud with this. Uh, this would be a frequency of an internal gravity wave, a G mode. Right? You see the problem is outside of this region, they're evanescent. And so even if they were present, they have to tunnel through a, a high region, a large radius region where the wave is um, evanescing rather than propagating. Okay? I'm sorry? Well, this is an adiabatic. I'm showing here an adiabatic analysis. They don't become unstable in the adiabatic analysis. What happens is they literally evanesce. So the wave amplitude would decay exponentially away from this boundary in this, in this type of analysis. OK, so let's start with acoustic waves, the P modes, and giants. So um, giants have much larger outer convection zones than the, than the sun, a much larger extent of their radius is occupied by convection. Uh, and if I take the WKB analysis and I ask what's the frequency of these waves, of the acoustic waves, this is the analytic form I get where N is going to be the number of radial nodes and L is the angular uh, YLM. Um, and this, you can show this frequency spacing, delta nu, is roughly 
correlating with the time it takes a sound wave to traverse the star. Okay? Since the star is in hydrostatic balance, this integral directly maps to a mean density because the sound speed knows about the fact that it has to hold up the star. And so this, you can get a mean density if you can measure this delta mu. Okay? So that's good. That's going to give me m over r cubed. And you're going to see that's important. Yeah, the, the turning point's really close. That little, that's a little correction to the turning point. Yeah, correct. That's right. So, yep. Okay, so there's a long, rich history of what we would expect, which I'm going to skip, okay? Because in some sense now we have data. Um, and I'm sorry for those who worked hard, <laughs> okay? But, you know, for the, it's, hard, it's a hard problem to predict the amplitude of the waves. Um, and there were a few ground-based measurements. There were about five to ten giants that had shown evidence for pulsations, uh, but the amplitudes were low. And so I'm just going to zoom ahead. So I'm not being a historian. Sorry, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So in 2009, the Corot uh, team announced the detection of non-radial modes with long lifetimes in giant stars. So in this case, they had more than 300 giants. Mode lifetimes were of order a month. This is just from their detection. Okay, so this is the, um, here's what the Fourier transforms look like. So again, you have to get used to their units. I hate them. Uh, they're all based on the sun, and they wouldn't change it. So uh, what's shown here are different stars. So each of these panels is a star. Um, and this frequency is in microhertz. So here's 70 microhertz, 30 microhertz. Um, they, this, you can't read this scale, but typically the amplitudes are 2 to 300, 2 to 200 parts per million. Okay, so this is just a brightness measurement. All they're doing is Fourier transforming the brightness measurement. What you can see is that there is a characteristic maximum frequency above which you see almost nothing. And, and around the maximum frequency, you, start, you can start seeing immediately that these are L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2, and sometimes L equals 3 modes. Um, and the property of the star, as I will show you, that tells us what this maximum frequency is, above which you see no power. Okay. So it's still the same as the mean. Yes. Well, let me say it this way. I, I haven't seen someone say it that way. What they typically show you is the, is the width of the mode in Fourier space. They don't tend to do phase folding, but I, I, hold that thought. There's there are some modes that they should phase fold. And I'll show you, which have much longer lifetimes. Uh, here's the, the Kepler paper from about a year later, um, and now I'm folding on delta nu, so I'm starting to now take that Fourier transform and I'm folding it on the frequency spacing. And so again, this helps you see that we're up to n of 12, 13, 14, 15. So to a theorist, I say that's great. N of 10, WKB should be valid, right? You have to be bold sometimes. Uh, but this large frequency spacing is well measured, um, allows for the identification of 0, 1, 2, and often L equals 3 from that little dispersion relation I showed you. And you get mean density measurements straight away, OK? I'm sorry? Delta nu is an acceptable parameter. Correct. For each star, you find its delta nu. So uh, zoom forward two years. So here's about 5,000 red giants for which all of that's been done. Um, and this is an HR diagram where this is indeed T effective. But what's plotted here, rather than luminosity, is the maximum frequency observed. Remember I showed you those stars where you could see the maximum frequency going up? Um, that maximum frequency I need to explain now um, because it, it has worked quite well. Uh, as the, what's called the acoustic cutoff. So what you have to imagine is I have this mode which has 10 nodes within the star. It's fixed frequency mode, but it has about 10 nodes. As that wave comes to the surface of the star, since omega is CSK, and the sound speed drops as you get near the surface, K gets very really high. The wavelength gets small. And there's a critical wavelength which is going to tell you whether the outer boundary of the star, aka the photosphere, looks like a reflecting or a transmitting boundary which is the wavelength of the wave relative to the local scale height. Okay? And if the wave is a high frequency, its wavelength is small, and basically it can leak out. And that gives you an excess damping, 
which means that those modes don't get the high amplitude. Okay? Um, and that's being said here. Um, that then knows about little g divided by the sound speed. You do that algebra. Little g you measure. Observers measure little g from the spectrum. Um, and they measure the sound speed from T effective. And so we measure omega max. And so here's the relation, which is calibrated. I'll show you for nearby stars. For the maximum frequency as a function of the mass of the star, its radius, and its T effective. So as a star gets larger, this nu max drops. And that's what you see. As these stars are much higher up on the giant branch, the nu max is 10 microhertz for these, whereas there's 1,000 microhertz down here for the sun. But this is a measurement now, nu max. You've definitely got T effective. You have from the frequency spacing, m over r cubed. And now you can get m and r independently. It's in the whole luminosity. These are just white, white light measurements, basically. OK? It, they, they, fit, they basically fit a Gaussian to the peak, is how nu max is defined, observationally. Yep, they do. You, can see, you can sort of see it. That's what they do. Okay. So combined with the frequency spacing, you can now get the mass and the radius. So again, for thou tens of thousands of stars, they're getting the mass and the radius. And that's not easy. Um, so here's what it looks like. This is an original paper from Corot showing this exercise. Again, I, this is where the Corot fields are, uh, these two fields in Corot. Here's the radius distribution of the stars. Here's 10 R sun, here's 20. Here's the mass distribution of these stars. You can see there's error bars because they have red giants of la mass less than 0.5. That should worry you, okay? Um, but this is early days in, in 2013, early days. Um, the way we've done that, not we, I haven't shown you anything yet that I've done, just to be clear. I'm really reviewing for you right now. But let me show you um, how you best test this to date. So on this slide, I'm going to sort of summarize where we, where we are so far in this talk. So acoustic waves are seen basically in every evolved star. There's some that don't have them. They're weird. We call them weird now. Okay. You get RM and the distance. Now, right? You get an inferred distance because I have a brightness, I have an R, I have a T effective. Okay, this is going to be a fantastic thing that can be tested with Gaia. And there's a tremendous amount of galactic science that's now enabled, none of which I'm going to talk about, but Juna can give a talk on that whenever she feels ready. Okay, so to answer your question, Michael, here's showing the distance from Hipparchos for the size relative to the seismically inferred distance. This is the best way we can test how this exercise is working. And basically, it's about a 10% exercise at this point. So the masses you're going to see are you know, 5 to 8. There, there's some double line binaries. So you know, typically, 5 to 10% kind of stuff. Okay. So everything I've told you so far, you roughly get from Kepler or from Corot in about 20 days. 20 days of data, you can do this. Okay. So with K2, this is all happening, for, okay, again, but in different fields. These are Hipparchos. This is Hipparchos. Oh, okay. yeah, this will like Correct. Yeah. Right, right. So Gaia will, so there's, you know, 10,000 predictions for distances sitting somewhere in a database, which Gaia can just test pronto. Are you um, there's been some work on binaries. I, I haven't seen that yet. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened. There's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you modes whose lifetime is thousands of years in a minute that we've also seen. OK? So. You decide. I mean, is there any reason to suppose that Hipparchus um, is, is more accurate than Scott? I'm not going <laughs> to. I don't. I, I can't answer that, Scott. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
OK. So I'm going to launch to the next thing that happened. OK? This is the next thing that happened observationally. So let me first remind you of your stellar evolution. So this is just a blow up of the tip of the red giant branch. So here goes a red giant branch star, one solar mass star. Uh, here's the, um, uh, the RGB bump. Here's a star that's going up to the tip of the red giant branch. At this point, it's 60 million years from getting to the helium core flash. Here it's 30 million years to get into helium core flash. Helium core flash happens. So I said the star comes crashing down for two million years. It bounces around, and then it sits in the clump. Okay. How much mass has the star? Uh, I would say none. We have no. I mean, the theory theory wise, none. There's no mass loss associated with the core flash theoretically. Uh, red giants do have mass loss. Yep. Jill and I have had lots of communication about this over the years. But not all, by the way. Definitely not all. We see tons of clump stars that are just no evidence, no, no evidence for mass loss. So. That's correct. Okay, so here's the problem. Oops, sorry. If you're an observer and you find a star out in the field, um, you really can't tell whether it's a star going up or a star sitting here at this luminosity. And of course, this is why it's called the clump, because suddenly there's many more stars at that luminosity. It's also important to remember, for those of you who like, like to remember facts, that the time it takes an RGB star to get from here up is the same as the lifetime on the clump. So roughly half of the stars at this luminosity are on their way up and half are in the clump. Okay? So that's a good quiz test for the young ones in the crowd. But there's no way you know, because you don't know the T effective, who's, who's who. Okay? Those days are over. So here was the first evidence from Corot that something else was happening. So this is a very busy plot. It doesn't really just, just stare at the top plot. So what they're showing is L equals 0, L equals 2. So this is frequency. So they're showing you multiple cases of the frequency spacing. So here, there's the frequency spacing from here to here, from here to here. And you see that at L equals 2, there's typically one mode. But around L equals 1, and they've suggestively uh, put in multiple things here. At L equals 1, it's often a mess. At L equals 1, L equals 1, L equals 1. Not a, not a single mode appears to be present. Many modes appear to be present, not just one. Here's the same uh, from Kepler. And this is a much more distinctive plot. So what they've done here is they've taken, again, thousands of stars. And here they've just literally taken them all and e for each star divided by delta nu, and then just plotted up the ridges for different stars of uh, L equals 2, L equals 0, and here's L equals 1. And here's L equals 3, actually, because sometimes you have L equals 3. Remember, these are full disk measurements, right? So at some high L, you're going to start losing things just because of cancellation. What you see is that at L equals 1, it's extremely, there's more modes, there's more, the A, there's more, no, more modes in terms of counting, and B, there's a, a large amount of um, frequency distribution. So more modes than allowed by acoustic waves, and this, this, this is mostly around L equals 1. So what is this? These are extra modes. These are other modes. Um, these were predicted theoretically, um, going back to the 70s. Um, when, when people started looking at what would ha the, t the structure of the mode, so let me show you. So this is now a propagation diagram, but for a red giant. So uh, this is the brunt weissel frequency. This is the hydrogen burning shell. This is the helium core. This is the radiative layer. Here's the, the convection zone is here and goes out of the convection zone of the red giant. Here's the lamb frequency. I put this line at new max, so the modes we're observing are at this frequency. So they're going out to a large radius, which goes out beyond this plot. Those are the acoustic waves. There's a tunneling region from here to here that has to where the mode evanesces, and then inside of here they're propagating. Okay, so there's a G mode cavity in here that does have a, a, a evanescent zone, but that evanescent zone it only gives you about one e fold. It's going to be easier for L equals 1 than L equals 2 because that's the, that's the L equals 2 line. So L equals 2 is harder to get in than L equals 1. And that's going to come up as I get to the end of my talk. So you, 
I'm sorry? This was probably a 10 R sum, sorry. So for this star, at this moment, the bottom of the convective zone is about 0.5 R sun. This is the bottom of the convective zone. All from here to here is convective, all the way out to the surface. Roughly by order of unity. It's, uh, it's not the same in the sun. We'll have to go back and look. Yeah. We'll have to go back and look at this whole. The convection zone in the sun is roughly 0.8 to about 1. Right. If life were only that simple for everything yeah, no, we do. There's a different. I haven't done the integral for the sun. I've done the integral for this case. You can do the integral for the sun. You've got 20 minutes. <laughs> so um, this coupling strongest for L equals 1, and as I'm going to show you, um, the frequency is very low uh, relative to the peak of the brunt. So these are going to be extremely high order G modes. Okay. So here's what they look like. So one code to do this with is Gyre, which Rich Townsend's the main author of, which is now coupled to Mesa. And this just shows you for a star that's on the red giant branch near the luminosity bump, so it's just below the clump, two different eigenfunctions, just to give you sort of some intuition. So uh, this eigenfunction uh, A is an acoustic wave. Out at the surface, it's got one, two, three, four, five, yeah, about eight nodes. Looks about right. What's the horizontal axis? Horizontal axis here is energy, basically mode inertia. Horizontal, horizontal axis. radius. Sorry, in, in units of the star of the of the object. So one is the surface. Sorry. Okay. So the so the, this is yeah this is linear. So the red giant the helium dwarfs way down at the center, as you're going to see right here. Right. Let me just blow up. So these both are normalized to the amplitude and the core being the same. And so this guy has a much larger amplitude out at the surface. That's the P-dominated mode. Uh, a G mode that's, a, that's uh, adjacent to it in frequency has the same amplitude in the core, but because of the evanescent decay, has much less amplitude at the surface. Okay? But this gives you some sense for the complexity of these. And down in the core, the, in the degenerate helium core, a huge amount of oscillation is going on. Here's the number of nodes of the G, you know, 450, 500. So we're in, we're really in the WKB, WKB limit for the G modes. Right? These are really high order G modes. In the evanescent, there's a brief evanescent region, so it's propagating, yeah. and there's 500 oscillations, say. Then there's an evanescent zone where it decays, which oh, you can't yeah. see on this plot, really. It's, it's basically right in here. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's, oh, and then it's and then, again. And then it's oscillating as an acoustic wave. So it's a mixed, oh, what we call a mixed mode. Turns into, turns into it. has yeah. All of these have both properties. Some of them are more dominating in the core. Some are in the envelope. Okay. But we're giving him 20 minutes to do it himself. Okay, so here are two stars that to the observer would look identical, roughly same L, same T effective. These are the power spectra from them, okay? Um, and for L equals one for this, you'll notice that the breadth of the lines away from it are different than another star that's sitting here where the L equals one, you see are, they're very distinctively split. Okay, so these two are the, what we call the mixed modes. One of these, some of these are more G mode in, intrinsic. The core acoustic wave is also knows about the, um, the G mode in the interior. But you'll see that the period spacing of these two is totally different. Okay. And we now know that this is a clump star, and this is a star on the red giant branch, because this period spacing is consistent with the degenerate helium core. This period spacing is consistent with a star that's doing helium burning. Okay, 
These are what the data look like. Uh, so this was Tim Bedding's result from 2011. So again, this is the, um, uh, fr the frequency spacing. So stars evolve from here this way. So this is going up the red giant branch, where all these L equals 1 modes were split by a period spacing of about 50 to 60 uh, seconds. Whereas for the same star with the same surface properties on the clump, totally different period spacing. So basically, the two populations split, completely split. This is the same. Uh, from Benoit Mosse, um, showing the, basically the same data. This is actually, it's not the same data, sorry, Corot, same result. So, you'll, man, you are just two slides ahead of me. You know, five years ago, you yeah, couldn't answer that question, but I can, you can now. Uh, so here's more, more modern uh, data. This is Dennis Stello's work in collaboration with us showing, uh, showing what these period spacings look like. Um, now he's color coding them based on the mass inferred from the astroseismology. So these are roughly two solar mass stars um, sitting here. Here's what we expect theoretically. Uh, this is from work we've been doing with MESA, showing the red giant branch going this way, and then the clump stars, which indeed sit on the, you can see, on the, quite a good uh, map. Okay. Here's the mass distribution that's inferred uh, for the stars that are in the sample. And there's some stars that are in weird locations. It's a whole nother talk, which I'm really not going to give today. Um, this is the most recent one from ben, uh, Benoit Marceau. Again, um, a lot of this is automated. So as time goes by, things are people are cleaning more. You know, it's kind of hard to tell exactly how they do all this. It's a, you know, those power spectra are ratty. Um, and so things are getting improved. And it's always a little bit scary because you wonder if they're throwing anything out. Um, but here's the red giant branch going up. Here's the clump stars. And then they've noted some of these with little f's. Uh, this is some work we did a few years ago talking about those stars that are in the two million year period undergoing helium core flashes. Their interior structure is totally different. It's between. Um, and they, they should have different period spacings. And they're that way for two million years out of 100. So it's one in 50 stars in the clump should be actively going helium core flashes. And that's still an active observational puzzle. But all these little f's are the ones that Benoit thinks may be the systems we talked about. No, it's a helium. It's just called a helium core flash. I just had to show this because you know, for those of you who, who like to go out and look at open clusters, you know, this is just really remarkable. So this is NGC six seven one nine, which is a metal rich cluster near the galactic center that was in the original Kepler field. Um, this is showing uh, the red giant branch. So these are the stars in the in the cluster, all known members, um, and it, it was Kepler did it. And again, now these all are known to be clump stars, and these are all known to be red giant branch stars. So they're just sort of in your face. You can see the distinction. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of the work I'm going to start talking about is work we've been doing in Santa Barbara. And I have to always uh, talk about MESA, since that is the main tool we've been using for this. Um, and the main developer is Bill Paxton. Uh, this is. Uh, Bill, uh, this was younger Bill, um, uh, um, and this is the first instrument paper we wrote. We decided every two years or so, we, in the attempt to keep up with Bill, we'd write what we called an instrument paper, um, so that the community had something to refer to uh, beyond whatever comments Bill ch chose to put into the code. Um, we've got about 700 users now, um, and we just wrote our third instrument paper, which just got published in After Supplements. Um, and we're creating authors, and it's harder every time. And the, it's 45 pages this time. Uh, but there's a lot of capabilities, and many of you know about that. For those of you who uh, want to come to a summer school, we ha every summer in Santa Barbara offer Mesa Summer School. Um, it's one week. That's when it is next summer. I really would encourage you to come. Nobody is too old or too young to come. We've had Faculty, we've had faculty, retired faculty, down to undergraduates participate, um, and um, many prominent professors are displaying proudly their cer certification <laughs> in their office. So please do come uh, when the announcement goes out uh, for next summer. Um, okay, and then what I'm going to talk about now is a collaboration that we've been working on with Frank Timmy's, uh, Yuri Tumre, and Rich Townsend, Owen Zweibel. Uh, it really is to do supernovae progenitors, um, where you want to get the, the chemistry right, but also the rotation angular momentum right. Uh, we're not on that. We're not doing 
that problem yet because we've gotten so, well, some of us are, but we've gotten so distracted by what's happening in Kepler. And that's what I'm going to talk about now in the last 15 minutes is rotation and angular momentum, sorry, rotation and magnetic fields for these same cores, okay? So we now have evidence of modes that exist in the helium core. We've got them, okay? So now you can start asking questions about rotation and, as I'm going to show you, start to probe magnetism by using the seismology that we have. Okay, and that's uh, what I want to do now. So let me start with rotation. And let me first just set the stage for you uh, to give you some intuition. And this is a, a sort of a trivial exercise, and you can also look at the paper by Tayar and Pinsano on this. There's many people working on this problem. So take the sun today rotating at 30 days, ignore the differential rotation, just take it at 30 days, and just take each fluid element, and as the star evolves, just for a moment, just conserve angular momentum. Don't do any transfer, okay? Just ask, what would be the rotational state of that Lagrangian ball, okay? And for the inner core, the inner 1%, that's, that collapses and forms the core of the helium white dwarf, and as it goes up the red giant branch, this would be the rotation rate. So it's sitting here at 30 days, it would be rotating, um, as you can see, at about half a day, okay? And do that for different shells. Do that for the outer envelope. The outer envelope expands, it would spin down. So trivial statement, you know, we are gonna be generating tremendous shear just by stellar evolution is gonna is generate shear. Yeah, those electrons is the energy of time. Sorry, sir. This, this is the luminosity of the star as it goes up the red giant branch, so it's time. Okay. It's time. Q is the mass fraction, so this is if you interior to that point. So if you so the rigid case is you just say it's fully rigidly rotating. That's what you would get if you were fully rigidly rotating, and then these are just just extra. This is just an exercise in angular momentum conservation during stellar evolution. <laughs> Michael, at 30 days. So so post. Post main sequence. Oh, 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 so the the inner ball is rotating at 30 days, the irradiative layer roughly, and then the outer part there's differential rotation and latitude, and if my memory's right, the the rotation rate of the core matches some mid latitude rotation, and it's order I don't know 15 percent I've forgotten about 15 percent in latitude. Okay, is it? It's a little slower than the, like I said the 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 core is rotating at something between, you know, that's, that's not the slowest or the fastest. So the sun is just sitting. Here's the sun, zero, 30 days. I just set it at 30 days. I mean, I mean the sun as it is now. Yes. Today, the sun is elf sun. Yeah. This is, so today, I take the sun today and I go forward. Okay. I don't care about the past. All right, everybody good? I'm generating differential rotations. The helium core is contracting. The outer envelope's expanding. Okay. Okay. So, in Kepler, what was found was evidence for rotational splitting of the L equals one G mode. Okay? So this is a blow up of what you, know, you call the typical case. So here's L equals zero, here's L equals two. Here's the, all of the mess around L equals one. So this is the P mode that's the main acoustic wave, okay? These are the G modes, these are mostly in the core, mostly in the core, here's a G mode mostly in the core, okay? You can see that these are split into triads, M equals zero, M equals one, M equals minus one, okay? And you may notice that the splitting for the wave whose mode energy is mostly in the acoustic envelope is different than the splitting of the mode who's primarily in the core. So we have direct evidence for differential rotation. Um, and we're going to now start to measure the rotation rate of the core from these data. Okay? 
everybody, this is like the, this is the textbook case. This is what it looks like. And Benoit Mosset uh, had some of the first data on this. So again, everybody chooses a different x-axis. My apologies, but I it can only do so much. Um, so now this is a function of the radius of the star. So it's expanding. So time is marching this way. These are stars on the red giant branch. The cores of these stars are rotating between 10 and 20 days. Okay. Um, they go up to the tip of the red giant branch. We can't observe them. They come back. They sit on the clump. When they're on the clump, they're rotating about 100 days. Okay. So in terms of this plot, uh, here's where they sit. Angular momentum constant for the core, if it conserved its angular momentum, would be rotating about 100 times faster. So the, these cores have lost, well, 90, I've got the number there, about 95% of the angular momentum in the core has been sent out. It, it's been sent out into the outer high moment of inertia thing. It doesn't care at all. It can easily take it, no problem. No problem. There's tons of moment inertia out there. This is the this is a point meant to represent 10 to 20 days. That's what that is. I'm sorry. No, no, no. This is on the red giant branch. On the way up. On the way up. This is on the way up. This is the other one. Yeah, so right now I'm just, that's right. Yeah, so there's a whole question of how this varies with mass. It hasn't really been studied in detail yet from the observers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so if you go, yeah, fair question. So if I go back to here, what Tim's noting is that these are color-coded. You can see that, I mean, this is, this is now still actively, there's a lot going on here right now. Um, and let, let me, yeah, so what you're pointing out is that these are all sort of 1 to 1.5. Where are the twos, okay? Um, just to, just to give you a big cause for concern, some of you may not be concerned yet. Um, you can start to imagine how this gets tough observationally. So if I was spinning twice as fast or three times as fast, these would start to this would start to look difficult to differentiate to pull out who's who. Okay, so there's still a lasting concern for many of us that the more rapidly rotating systems are being missed. Um, and it's hard to tell. Uh, the observers, I mean, they're my friends. I respect them. Um, and they have automated things to do this, and they start with X thousand stars, and they end with X minus something thousand stars, and some of them get lost. And, and, and you know, when you look at those Fourier transforms, they're kind of messy. So there, there could be some rapidly rotating objects in there, okay, just to be clear. This is about 90% of the stars in the sample, though, where they can do this exercise. So the majority are slow rotating. But it's important to say. Well, the, 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 this, this is fully, in a, this is just an acoustic wave, this L equals zero. This guy could have some G modes in him. At L equals two, it's possible. It's a little bit harder. It, yeah. Right, right. So uh, for this one, I can't answer. I mean, this one, you, you, you see a much better amplitude separation. Uh, for this one, nobody's talked about the splitting for the L equals two, is a short answer. Okay. Right. Correct. Because Correct. The anyway. Correct. Yeah. So, so small, yeah, you're, you're absolutely bigger. you're absolutely right, Roman. So let me, and I should have said that. Um, this is because there's more mode inertia out in the envelope, but indeed this rotational splitting is from the evanescent tail that's in the core. Yeah, that's correct. But there's a bit of it. There's a all the p modes they've as you're going to see in the last bit of my talk. The p modes have an evanescent tail, and the tail will be wagging the dog in a minute. The G mode spectrum is really dense uh, underneath the P mode spectrum, so there's always a G mode near the P mode. It's a really dense spectrum. No, that, that's correct. It doesn't. That's right. Do we know the actual rotation rate of the ones that are slower? They're slow. Yeah, these are slow. They're slow. Yeah. Okay, so where am I? I'll go here. So I'm just going to flash this up. So there are many recipes um, 
in stellar evolution for handling angular momentum transport, all of which are being used everywhere. And so we said, well, do any of them work for this problem? And the short answer is no. Um, and so this is a paper that Matteo wrote recently. Uh, so if you didn't do anything funny and just let it go, it would be spinning like this um, with fluid instability. So this is inst just using fluid shear instabilities. You'd have a huge, here's the data, by the way, sitting at 10 days. Um, if you turn on all of the current recipes for what's called Sprout-Taylor, set of magnetic dynamo actions, taking weak radial fields and twisting them and getting buoyant instabilities that trigger transport, those are the, that's the red line, um, and the data are here. So basically, there's no, you know, we, we've not solved the angular transport problem at all. And this is the first serious quantitative test. And this is what's used for all of massive star evolution, for deciding in total rotation states of cores, and Adam's just blushing now. Uh, he's smiling. <laughs> he's smiling. <laughs> okay, so that's just bad news, but that's life. All right, so in the last five minutes, I want to talk about what's about to come out in science and work done by Jim Fuller, Matteo, myself, Rafa Garcia, and Dennis Stello. So Dennis, back in March, uh, was visiting Santa Barbara and showed us this plot, which is a really busy plot. Uh, at a given new max, so stars evolve in this direction, what he's showing here is the visibility of the L equals one mode. It's basically an amplitude of the L equals one relative to the amplitude of L equals zero. Okay, just think of it that way. There's a class of stars which have a depressed amplitude of L equals one, okay? And this was published by Benoit Morset in 2012 and none of us noticed it. Um, and I'm gonna show you, Dennis has fantastic data on this. So what he showed us was there's some number of stars where if I just put up the power spectrum, the L equals one is depressed or gone. Okay, that's the data. So let's go back to this plot. This is the evanescent region here. For, here's L equals one, here's L equals two. So again, the L equals two do not as strongly couple as L equals one. So if there's anything funny happening in the core to give me excessive damping, I'm gonna see it first in L equals one. L equals zero doesn't work, I need a non-radial mode, okay? So the first hypothesis we checked was, let's just, we said, well, let's just assume there's a transmission coefficient every time the acoustic wave hits that bottom evanescent zone, there's a transmission and a reflection condition. We can calculate the transmission coefficient. Let's just have that become a new damping mechanism that every time it hits, it has a probability of transmitting, and if it goes in, it doesn't come out. Let's just say that that's what we're gonna test, okay? Doesn't come out, that's the hypothesis for now. We're not gonna let it hit the core and go back and try again. That's correct, okay? So this is the same data from Benoit, um, and if you make that assumption and you're using the damping time, just the envelope damping time, as it goes between five and 20 days, this would be uh, the envelope of a mode that is just excessively damped in the core, okay? Independent of any mechanism, this is what you would predict if there's excessive damping in the core, okay? So that's sort of step one. Um, what's the criteria for suppressed dipoles? You're I mean, what's the 70 metros? You're asking about these guys. Why aren't these a different color? Yeah, that was yeah. You oh, just okay. hold your thought until I show you the better data set. Yeah. Well, they, they'll, they'll, they, each time they have a probability. They, yeah, yeah, and so L equals two, right, L equals. Right. Okay, L equals two, most of it reflects, right? So that's the, okay. You good, Jeremy? You good, okay. Okay, so then the question is what's causing this? And, um, we, we really spent a lot of time debating ourselves between rotation and magnetism. We're preferring magnetism today, and let me sort of walk briefly through that. So these G modes are really high radial order. 
as they go in. So I, that, what that means is I have a large amount of shearing in the genome, tremendous amount. And so I can calculate roughly what magnetic field strength I would start to modify the restoring for, for, for a radial field or a colloidal field. Um, and that's, uh, that's this, where this is the omega of the mode, the radius it's at, the local brunt weissler frequency and the density. And I'll show you a plot of this in a minute. So, the, so what I'm going to basically do in the la next few minutes is just say that if I, if I have a place in the star as I go in where the field's this strong and I encounter high magnetism, it's going to modify my angular structure enough that when the wave comes back out, it's no longer an L equals 1 mode. It has higher L's in it, in which case the evanescence back out is inhibited. Okay, it's hard to tunnel out. So it's what we're sort of calling for fun uh, magnetic greenhouse effect. <laughs> yeah. 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 So first let me just show you the bottom plot, which is as a function of radius in the star, you take the properties of the star and you calculate what's the local condition. And that's this magnetic field. That's the local magnetic field you'd need at any, at any location to just get this equality. Okay, here's the seismic uh, propagation diagram. It's coming as an acoustic wave. Here's the evanescent zone. Here's my brunt weissler frequency. If I set that value to here and assumed a dipole outside of that, here would be where it would transition to an alpha wave. Okay, um, and so the main point is that at the hydrogen burning shell where the brunt's quite high, I need a field of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 gauss. That's what this implies. Okay. We have no idea the structure of this field because we Th this field's very likely anything but axisymmetric. It's the result of the convective core burning, which is what I'm going to show next. Okay, so here's the cartoon, right? The cartoon is, uh, it each, here's my acoustic cavity. It has a probability each time of tunneling through. If it gets in and hits this, which we've drawn as a dipole, it's easy. Um, basically, the, the high L nature of that scattering would inhibit it to come back out, okay? Um, and, you know, there's, we've got a paper coming that sort of do, does more of this algebra for you. Okay, so now here's the current data from Dennis Stello. So this is appearing in a separate paper that's um, likely to appear soon in Nature, which is why that stupid little embargo thing is there. Um, so now this is a much richer data set than what Benoit had originally. So this is the same thing showing the suppressed systems, but as a function of mass. So here's the low mass stars, 0.9 to 1. And almost none of them are suppressed. As you go up in mass, you start to see there's more appearing, more appearing, more appearing. This line is the line I showed you before. That's the theoretical prediction if there's just excessive damping in the core. Okay? So that's a theoretical line. That's not a fit to the data. There's some fuzz around it. Okay? Um, and so you blow it up, so here's stars between 1.4 and 1.6. You can start to see that the fraction is getting very high. If it gets up to around 2, it's the majority of the stars have the depressed dipole. What's the yeah. Huh? <laughs> I told you what B was, 10 to the 6 gauss. But, you, but it, it's very low. That's why it's not Here we go. Okay? So these are the data, um, and this is what's um, right now likely to appear in nature soon. Uh, so this is a function of mass of the stars. Um, so here's the full sample. So here's the ones which have normal dipoles and those that are suppressed. So around 1 to 1.5, most of them have normal dipole amplitudes. That's how we measure the G modes anyway, right? I mean, this is the problem. It's, it's a nasty problem. If you ask me, how do I get magnet, how am I going to measure the rotational state of one that's magnetic? I'm dead because it doesn't, I can't measure, make the measurements. It's just going to be frustrating. Um, so here's the total sample, and then this is showing the fraction that have suppressed dipole. Okay. Um, this sample's been given to people, blind, in the hopes that they will tell us. That exercise is happening right now. Right? So we blinded them. We just said, you know, okay, tell us if there's something funny. Well, these are all red giants for which we have the only photometric data we have of any value is really from, from, from this mission, from Kepler. 
And no, I don't think anybody's gone through to look for long-term cycles yet in this sample. So let me just remind you of a little bit of stellar evolution. Uh, this is the boundary from convective core hydrogen burning and not. Okay, so to us, this is why we favor the magnetic hypothesis, is convective core hydrogen burning gives you an opportunity uh, to get magnetic fields. Uh, what's expected? So there's some work that's been done, um, and there's a lot of work underway on core convection and dynamo action. This is a two solar mass star. This was done by Sasha Brun, oops, um, um, Matt Browning and Yuri Tumre about 10 years ago. Um, and the field strengths, this is just showing you uh, BR and B phi. Uh, the field strengths reach 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 Gauss in obviously tangled configurations, but it really does depend on the rotational state. So we'd, we'd blame the diversity on the, the initial rotational state, because all of these are going to have core convection. But remember, this is, this is at the right place. It's in the convective core. That convective core, however, undergoes tremendous hydrostatic uh, contraction, uh, giving an opportunity with, with flux freezing to increase these fields even higher. But I'm already starting at near 10 to the 5 Gauss, and I only need about 10 to the 6. Okay? So, say again? Right, so that so the, the hypothesis is is that some it's a magnetic field in the magnetic field hypothesis it would be that there, there's most of them are you know they're either magnetized or unmagnetized at this level. There's one star uh, who has a name I forgot the name they name them uh, where actually across the power spectrum you can see because there's a, about a factor of two in frequency you can see the depression shift across. So there's one that's just kissing the magnetic condition. It depends totally on the structure of the star. So let me. Yeah, yeah, some numbers, so so pause, really pause, pause. Let me put this up. Okay, I've got a slide after this, which will hope, hopefully help you. So that's all I've got to say. I'm going to shut up now. Thank you.